Welcome to the Great Reset Opportunity Report. I'm Chris Blasey. Today's guest is Brian London. Brian is coming to us with a career that spans four decades in the financial markets. Currently, he's the CEO of Jefferson Financial and the longtime editor of the Gold Newsletter. Brian, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Chris. Brian, do you want to give a little bit more about your background so that you can share? Sure. You know, I, I started in the industry about, uh, shoot, 33 years ago now as a writer and researcher for Jim Blanchard. Uh, Jim was the was known as the, uh, uh, the ultimate gold bug. And uh, he was the guy or one of the guys and in, in really a driving factor in getting gold legalized in the early 1970s. It used to be absolutely illegal to own gold, just like owning, you know, cocaine, plutonium, or anything else. The government didn't allow its citizens to have this protection against inflation. So uh, Jim kind of spearheaded some efforts to advocate and protest that and, and get gold legalized. Uh, as part of that, he started Gold Newsletter in 1971, lit literally on the day that Nixon closed the gold window. And then in 1974, when it became obvious that the legislation was going to be passed and gold was going to be legalized, he decided to have a conference to teach American investors how to invest in gold. That is That was the genesis of what we have today as the New Orleans Investment Conference. That's great, uh, Brian. So what you know, um, well, at our show here, we kind of focus on what we see is a transformation happening around the world that are gonna affect nations, financial markets, economics, very mm -hmm. all encompassing and what we believe very wide in scope. You know, the term is being picked up by a lot of other analysts and they're kind of referring to it as the great reset. Now, of course, everyone's got a little bit definition of what that is and what that entails. So we kind of like to start the show off, you know, hearing from someone like yourself with a lot of experience. Personally, how would you define the great reset? And do you believe this is something that's happening? Well, I believe it's something that's going to happen. You know, the timing is, is the question. Um, yeah, I'm a big believer in that. When, you know, I look at it from the grand scope of things. When Nixon closed the gold window, when there was no longer any uh, tie between gold and the dollar, that was, that was really uh, the starting gun on a new era where central banks could really do whatever they want. They could print money to uh, their heart's desire without any real repercussions or direct repercussions. And, uh, and they were like the teenager that gets a, a bottle of whiskey and the keys to the car, and they just drove it into the road in the 70s, you know, drove it off the road in the 70s, just went out of control. And from then on, they became a bit more circumspect, a bit more careful. But it, every uh, downturn, every slowdown in the economy and or the markets in actuality was greeted with a flow of liquidity or accommodative money, monetary policy. Initially, it was lowering interest rates, and we saw that. Greenspan did that a couple times. The next, uh, so the market gets somewhat inured to that. You know, they, the, the patient develops a tolerance to the drug, so the next episode, uh, the dosage has to be increased to the point where in the 2008 crisis, they had to resort to quantitative easing for the first time and also lower rates to the lowest levels in 5,000 years of, of human history. So now we have the result of that. We have equity prices at historic highs. We have a reinflated housing market, uh, all due really to, uh, largely due to this monetary policy, this unprecedented level of accommodation. So eventually we're going to have another bubble that's going to burst and the Fed's gonna to have to come in and they're gonna to have to do it again. Um, but again, to a greater degree than they ever did before. At some point, everyone's just going to realize that this is silly, that they're going to lose complete confidence in the, the currency and the dollar and really all fiat currencies. Whether that happens on the next blow up and, and uh, reliquification of the, uh, of the economy uh, remains to be seen. I think it may take a couple more cycles before people just throw up their hands and say there really is no value or credibility left in the, the current currency regime. Mm -hmm. I've had this, this, discussion slash argument with my friend Peter Schiff over and over again, he thinks it's the next one. Uh, the next one's going to be the big reset, as it were. I think it may take a couple more cycles 
Uh, but we'll see. It's, it's going to happen. And I think it's something that regardless of when it happens, people absolutely need to protect themselves against. Prepare so, for it. Sure. So you talked about, you know, how many cycles is it going to be before this mm -hmm. um, reset happens? So kind of on that point, there's a lot of experts now that will say, you know, we have some uh, prints of economic uh, data here in the United States, you know, as far as, um, you know, the employment rates and GDP growth that are kind of rosy and look, look robust. But a lot of people are saying it's not real, it's not sustainable, it's a <clears throat> calm before the storm. You know, for those folks that have that um, opinion, it's a calm before a storm and maybe some a quite violent storm. Where do you stand or you know, what's your position on that? Well, I think we are seeing, uh, due to the uh, uh, tax reform that Trump brought through, I think we are seeing a, a bit of an economic resurgence in the U.S. Um, but underlying that, we, we have some very real problems in terms of the debt. You know, uh, just like Reagan came into office and he was the biggest spender in, in American history, um, we, we see Trump coming in under the Republican banner and doing really the same thing again. Uh, the fiscal year ended at uh, the end of September. Uh, the federal debt stood $1.2 trillion higher than the previous year's fiscal year uh, ending. So we're, we're running at that rate. Not only that, but over the last six months, the, the, the federal debt has grown a trillion dollars. So the run rate right now, I mean, it's going to ebb and flow, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, the run rate is closer to $2 trillion. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're getting. That's where we are right now. We're getting uh, spending is, is going up again at, at breakneck uh, speed. And I think that's going to be a real problem going forward for the U.S. and the global economy. We saw that literally over the last couple of days as bond deals uh, started to surge globally. And, and I think what we're seeing is the, the uh, bond vigilantes coming back to the fore, not just in the U.S., but across the world and, and demanding higher returns for the risks that they see ahead. Sure. So now let's drill down to the Fed and the dollar, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the crux of any economy or the, one of the main building blocks is its money. You know, there's always debate about the Fed. You know, who does it really serve? What yeah. are its motives? What's its level of effectiveness in this more global economy right now? And of course, this all means it's going to affect the dollar and what does it mean for the dollar? So can you give us, can you give me your critique of the Fed and the dollar? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Their motives right now are to get interest rates high enough so that they can cut them again. That's simply put, that's, that's what they need to do. Um, their, their motives are also to create a wealth effect or have been to create a wealth effect by pumping up financial assets and housing assets. Uh, they've done that again, you know, on the upside of the Fed balance sheet, the, the correlation to the S&P 500 between the Fed's balance sheet and the S&P was about 97% on the way up. Uh, now they're contracting the balance sheet. So the worry there is that there'll be a correlation again on the way down. Um, their effectiveness is, is the real question. I, I, I think that we have to address, um, and, and it's going to be more and more important in rise more and more to the fore because as I mentioned, the bond vigilantes are, have, are beginning to show their faces again. Uh, back in March, they did it for one day when the Fed minutes came out and, uh, and, and investors really didn't think the Fed was taking things seriously enough. And they decided, heck, we're going to raise rates on our own and, and did so. Now we saw that again over the last couple of days where the, the market dictated rates and not the Fed. And, and I think that the Fed and, more broadly speaking, central banks in general are going to find that they're, they're actually losing control of this market. And, uh, and bonds have the very risk of a, of a major, major bear market or a crash at, at some point, given the debt loads we have today. So, again, with the Fed, the Trump administration appears to be something quite different from what we've had for a long time. And, you know, some people argue, is it really... You know, are they really taking different tact than the, those in the past? So as far as the Fed is concerned, do you think Trump and his administration are protagonists or antagonists in regard to the Fed? Oh, I think they're absolutely antagonists. 
I, I think Trump is a guy who, who doesn't respect the debt. He's not afraid of debt. He has no problem in running up debt. That's, that's obvious now. Uh, but he also likes low interest rates. He likes looser monetary policy. Um, it, he, right now, it's antagonistic. The real concern that I have is if it gets, if they get, they get to have a, a better relationship. If as Trump begins to put his people in the Fed and on the FOMC, that they turn to uh, uh, addressing his wishes and being more accommodative to please him. That's the real danger, I think. Um, regardless, the, the Fed's painted into a corner. There's not much they can do at this point. They don't have enough room to cut rates. And they know that a recession is coming. If it's not coming uh, at some point next year, then the year after that, it, it's, it's going to come. And they're just trying to get prepared for it at this point. Now, Brian, you're recognized as a real expert on gold and the precious metals. And it's been a tough year for investors. Right. So definitely, I'm sure you get asked this all the time. So for with your long history and experience, going out, let's just say the next two, maybe three years. Mm -hmm. What's your position, what's your forecast for gold and the precious metals? Well, I, the timing is always the key, but I think they're definitely headed up to old highs over the next two to three years. And the principal driver I see is that the Fed's rate hike campaign is, is probably about halfway up through. They we're probably on the back side of that. Uh, we had in the, next, in the last... Um, Fed meeting, we had some uh, statements and really the dot plot seemed to indicate that the Fed is planning on raising rates three times next year and maybe once or twice the following year. But basically, they're looking at now a terminal point for the Fed funds rate in this rate hike campaign of closer to three and a half to four percent. Previously, uh, a couple of governors, John Williams and, and William Dudley, had talked about two and a half percent to three percent. Um, I don't think they can get much over 3% because the problem there is that the debt service on the federal debt grows way out of proportion at higher interest rates. In fact, we can never have uh, so-called normal interest rates of 4 5 and 6% anymore because of the level of the debt. We just simply can't afford it. If we had a Fed funds rate of about 3.5% to 4%, that would imply a cost of financing the federal debt of around 5%. At that level, that gets you about $1.2 trillion a year on the budget just for debt service. Uh, that means about double to debt service, most of it going to China. Uh, then you're spending on, uh, on entitlements, on you know, welfare, social security, national defense, any of that. So I think that's politically impossible, and that alone could force uh, a default or a popular uh, or a political uh, um, uh, demand for some type of a default on the debt. I agree. Um, now, one thing I want to bring to everyone's attention here is you're the host of the New Orleans Investment Conference, you know, a great event. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about it? It's coming up quickly, so those who are interested would have to make plans. Um, so let us know about it and how people could uh, attend that. Sure. As I mentioned, Jim Blanchard started it in 1974, and uh, he was known for making a big splash, and we've tried to live up to that legacy. Over the years, we've had uh, Ayn Rand in her last public uh, appearance. We have Lady Margaret Thatcher, uh, Alan Greenspan a number of times, uh, Milton Friedman a number of times, F.A. Hayek, Barry Goldwater. The list just goes on and on. The, the bottom line is we bring the top experts and thought leaders in the world today in one place at one time, along with a, uh, an elite exclusive group of, of private investors. And you get to hear from these, these top experts in every sector, but uh, you know, also primarily addressing geopolitics, economics, and metals and mining stocks, plus you know, every other major uh, uh, asset class. You not only to hear, get to hear what they, their views, their unadulterated, unhedged views that they won't say on television, but you also get to talk to these people in the halls and ask them your questions and, and get to know them. Our attendees are also some of the most successful 
investors uh, in the world today, and they, they love to share ideas and experiences. So that's a real benefit of the event as well. Um, this year, we have Robert Kiyosaki, we have Mark Stein, we have Jonah Goldberg, James Grant, Doug Casey, uh, Peter Schiff, Dennis Gartman, Rick Rule, Guy Adami. Uh, the list goes on and on for dozens and dozens of more of, of experts, as I say, in every important uh, asset class and sector out there. So I just want to say to everyone listening, this is a tremendous event. I mean, New Orleans is a great city for any event like this where you're going to spend a few days. I mean, there's restaurants. Uh, the weather is usually nice. Um, mm -hmm. I've been there. Uh, there's a, the level of, of talent as far as uh, knowledge about markets, not just precious metals, but resources in general, equities, fixed income. You know, it's a great learning experience, a great way to uh, rub shoulders with a lot of folks that may, you may have just followed through newsletters and, and blogs, but you actually get to meet and, and uh, you know, talk to uh, directly. So I just want to encourage everyone um, who would be interested and could to head on down. Uh, Brian, thanks a lot for coming on. You know, you shared some, uh, ex you know, information that is very valuable based on your history. I hope to have you again on in the next few months as we watch things slowly unfold. You know, who knows what may change with the midterms? Maybe nothing. Maybe the Trump administration will be even more emboldened and uh, do things that are even going to have more of an effect. I think from our perspective, we see with investors, we believe a lot of people are kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what's going to happen four weeks from now and then are going to be committing into the market. But um, so with that said, again, Brian, thanks for coming on and uh, we'll see you real soon. Great. Thank you, Chris.